That's a great question. When we enter therapy with a patient, patients become ill because they have feelings that make them anxious. And then they avoid those feelings by using avoidance strategies that we call defenses. And the problem is when we have feelings that make us anxious and then we avoid them, our avoidance strategies, or what we call defenses, cause the problems. So the whole purpose of therapy is to see the ways you avoid the truth and then helping patients face what they usually avoid. And that's something that uh, Freud himself uh, made very clear in his papers in 1923. We have to help patients see how they avoid so that they can face what they usually avoid. In 1936, Anna Freud said the same thing. We have to help patients avoid what makes them anxious. So therapy always involves facing what makes us anxious. So in that sense, from the very beginning, we have the sense of the importance of facing what makes us anxious. Problem was, is that in early psychoanalysis, there wasn't a theory about anxieties that's discharged in the body. So in my early training in psychoanalysis, I knew about conflict, I knew about helping patients face what made them anxious, but I didn't have a theory that would enable me to regulate anxiety when it was too high. I knew about anxiety regulation, but I didn't know when it was too high. So the interesting thing about ICE-TDP is it enables us to assess when anxiety is going into the strided muscles, when we tense up or sigh, versus patients who, when we explore feelings, they get sick to their stomach, they get diarrhea, they have to go to the bathroom, they get migraine headaches, they get dizzy, they can't think, right? They get ringing in the ears. And then I began to see that from this perspective, that there was a way to uh, objectively see when anxiety was too high so that it could regulate it. So it was feelings are being explored at an optimal level of arousal. So I think that was the key difference that I learned in uh, making the shift from standard psycholytic psychotherapy to ICDP was that there was really a theory of anxiety so that Anna Freud, and Freud, Freud in particular in 1926, talks about signal anxiety, that anxiety is a signal that this feeling is dangerous. But now we can also regulate anxiety to make sure when we face things with patients that it's at a level of anxiety that they can bear, and it's also at a level of anxiety where the brain is still functioning. The problem is a lot of times therapists explore feelings with patients when anxiety is too high, and that prevents the brain from functioning. And so in that way, if the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus are shut down by neurohormones because of anxiety is too high, the patient literally can't think straight. They can't reflect on their projections. They believe projections. They can't reflect. So I think uh, ISTDP uh, added a great deal to psycholytic psychotherapy through this theory of anxiety and the way that it's discharged uh, through the central nervous system. I'm understanding, it looks like there's uh, several questions here. Um, obviously, when we work with patients, and this is true for all therapists, we want to achieve the most benefit for patients in the most time efficient way. That's true for everybody. That's not true just for ISTDB. No therapist is interested in patients suffering for eternity. So uh, the question really becomes, what's the most time efficient way to help patients get better? And, that, and we do find that helping patients face what they avoid, particularly feelings that they avoid, is what we need to do. Now, your question had to do first, um, do patients think that's a good idea? Uh, initially, most of them think not. Let's face it, if we've been avoiding things when we come into therapy, we know that our life isn't working, but we want to keep avoiding what we're avoiding. We've all had the experience that someone says, I think you need to look at such and such. No, it's not that important. I don't feel comfortable. Maybe later, right? We always want to avoid what makes us uncomfortable. So in a sense, that's human. Most of us come into therapy wanting to still avoid what we need to face. So in that sense, every therapy really involves helping the patient see how the ways they avoid feelings and issues actually doesn't protect them. It actually is creating their problem. So when we can help them see that what they do creates their problem, 
then they begin to realize, wow, that's not really helping me. Okay, it makes sense that I want to face the feelings I, I usually avoid. So, of course, we should expect that patients are going to resist a focus on feelings and what we avoid because when we focus on what they usually avoid, it's going to trigger anxiety. And we all avoid what makes us anxious. So I think it's important to understand it's normal to avoid what makes us anxious. So in a way, we have to work very hard to help them see how an avoidance strategy causes the problems rather than resolves the problem. Now, how soon should they expect to see change? This varies very much by patients. It varies very much by the severity of disturbance. There are some patients, very few, that can just need a few sessions and they already experience significant uh, symptom change. But you know, as in anything else, we see a spectrum of patients. Some patients can be seen in a few sessions. Some patients may need 150 or more sessions. Right, there's a spectrum of patients, they need a spectrum of time, and it'll probably be a spectrum of time in which we'll see significant character change. So you can have some patients respond in a few sessions, but other patients, it may take a while before we can bring their anxiety down. The patient I saw today, by 20 sessions, we had very significant change. Was it complete? No, he needed a lot more work. Uh, was he better in the second session? His anxiety was better, but uh, other symptoms hadn't changed yet. Um, I wouldn't expect them in someone who's really severely ill. The more severely ill a patient is, the more work we have to do, the more we have to regulate anxiety, the more projections we have to deactivate, the poorer the reality testing, of course, the longer the therapy uh, needs to be. And I think it's just important to understand there's a spectrum of patients, so there's going to be a spectrum of approaches and, as a result, a spectrum of time. Uh, we try to be time efficient, but that doesn't mean that all our cases are going to be short. That, that, that wouldn't be therapy, that would be magic. There's, again, there's several questions here. The first one is how much feeling? And it really depends on how much feeling does a patient need to face. Obviously, someone who's had a very good upbringing is not going to have a whole lot of feeling they need to face. Someone who's been really abused obviously is going to have massive rage towards his abuser. So it's going to be a much higher level of feeling that kind of person has to face. The question then becomes, are we open to the full spectrum of what patients need to face? And, and of course, you know, that uh, we, we sometimes forget uh, how much murderous rage figures in our lives. Um, anyone who has children knows that when you look at a, in, a, in a sandbox where children are playing, you see these soldiers and their heads are being ripped off and their arms are being ripped off and they get put in or they get buried in the sand and pulled out of the sand. You see doll houses where people are kicked out of the house and got off and heads are ripped off. Um, we also have fairy tales that children love, which usually involve like a wicked stepmother who's being eaten by a wolf. I mean, these fantasies of murderous rage, they're, they're very normal in childhood. And, these, and we, we feel these massive feelings of rage in childhood, and of course, over time, they're moderated. But in the course of therapy, yes, some patients have a massive amount of rage, and if they had physical or sexual abuse by parents, we certainly expect a lot of rage to come up, and hopefully we're open to that. Now, we have no right to push a patient to feel anything they don't want to face. And that's the other part of this. Right? We have right, no, no right to ask a patient to do anything they don't want to do. This is a collaboration. We're, help, hope, we're willing to help patients feel as much feelings as they want, to help them face as much as they want, but wherever they want to put a stop, we have to respect their stop. You know, this is therapy, it's not brainwashing, right? It ha there has to be a profound respect. After all, if you're trying to force a patient to face something they don't want to face, we become a psychological abuser, right? And, and it's extremely important. There was a marvelous book 
written uh, by Theodore Dorpat, a psychoanalyst, who talked about how in psychoanalysis, if you're not sensitive to these issues, you end up psychologically abusing your patients. So this is a problem not just in ISDDB or psychoanalysis, in any therapy, if we're not really attuned to the patient's will, um, we, we run the risk of engaging some kind of psychological abuse that would be very harmful, counter-therapeutic, and really shouldn't be in therapy. I find that sort of thing exasperating, you know? It's just, you know, when you present, you have an educational task, and you want to show patients, or the, rather therapists, what's the nitty-gritty basic work we do in psychotherapy? Yes, it's nice if there's an emotional breakthrough and so on, but basically we all like that moment, but the hard thing is how do we teach the methodical work that helps patients have breakthroughs that are healing? Unfortunately, oftentimes therapists, uh, due to narcissistic motivations, want to present you know, one breakthrough after another after another, and it's very destructive on many levels. First of all, it gives a totally unrealistic view of the work. Uh, I have seen articles where you see a little bit of inquiry, they do a little bit of defense work, and by the second page you're already in this unlocking in the conscious. You're like, where'd that come from? That's just totally weird. Reality is that we're starting out, sometimes we have to regulate anxiety, we help the patient see defenses they use, we help them see how, how to let go of those defenses, they begin to face feelings they usually avoid, we're building their capacity, we're building an alliance, we're building an understanding of what's causing their problems. There's a very methodical step-by-step -step process by which we build an alliance and an understanding between the patient, as a result of which, yes, a patient will have some breakthrough to emotions that they've usually avoided. But unfortunately, yes, it's, it's a terrible thing when people lose sight of the educational function, which is to show the methodical work you do rather than to show off some emotional moment. And the other pro reason that this is a problematic is that in session, when you are exploring feelings, you're building the patient's capacity gradually to bear intense emotions and anxiety. And likewise, you should do the same thing with an audience, because as they see emotions they haven't seen, if they see a kind of work they haven't seen, they see something they don't quite understand, they're going to become anxious, and then you're going to have a misalliance with your audience. So you want to really explain moment by moment everything you're doing so everyone can understand what you're doing. They may not agree, but at least they understand and you're managing their anxiety and so that then in the end, when there is a breakthrough to feeling, it doesn't seem like some kind of crazy uh, madman activity. But I, again, it, this is a big problem, I think, in ISTDP in the way it's oftentimes presented in ways that are very distorted. And so naturally people think, my God, this is a crazy thing. I'll tell a story. One time I had Davinlo himself, the founder of ISTDP, present in Washington, D.C. And in one day, he shows five cases Right? Five cases. And so we see a little bit of the problem, a little bit of inquiry, and then a, a, a murderous rage. And we see it five times in a day. So what do people think after a day like that? They think, well, this approach is all about murder. You know, because if you, if you present your work in a crazy way, people should think this is a crazy approach. So it's, uh, it's something that's upset me very much because I think that uh, it's, if you present your work in a distorted way, you shouldn't be surprised when people have distorted ideas about it. Same thing I think is true actually of psychoanalysis. Oftentimes people have very distorted about ideas about psychoanalysis instead of understanding how systematic and how thoughtful it is. So this is always a problem, I think, uh, in, how, in how we present our work. And of course, this is new for us because in a way it's new to actually present a videotape of your work so people can actually see what happens. And that's very arousing for everybody.
Oh, that's a good question. There is a lot of research to show that uh, CBT is an effective model. Uh, what's also clear in the CBT literature, however, is that they have a big problem with relapse in follow-up. In the United States, uh, the big study we did with our National Institute of Health, 50% um, of these depressed patients responded to CBT, which, which is good. However, when they examined those same patients uh, two years later, be at the three sites, between 77 and 88% of the patients who had gotten better had relapsed. So there's a very big relapse problem in CBT. And among the researchers in CBT, they've begun to realize that you need to look at unconscious issues that, are, that affect um, long-term follow-up. So you're seeing a lot more attention to emotion within CBT. You have Jeffrey Young's focus on transference, schema therapy, right? So they're in, in including a lot more about emotion. And a few years ago, Barlow, a major CBT theorist, said, hey, look, our theory of anxiety is wrong because neuroscience is showing that anxiety is not triggered by conscious thoughts. It's triggered by unconscious neuroception. And he said, we actually have to rewrite our theory of anxiety in CBT. Now, uh, in terms of uh, research basis, uh, a very important article came out a few years ago in the American Psychological Association's major journal um, by Jonathan Shedler. And in that, he did a meta-analysis of the outcome research in CBT and the outcome research in dynamic psychotherapy. And the research shows that the dynamic therapy uh, is at least as effective as CBT. And the other thing that's unique, though, is that whereas CBT has a problem with relapse and follow-up, in, uh, in dynamic therapies, what we find is that we have much less relapse, and we also have many patients who continue to improve after treatment. This is a kind of follow-up that we're not finding in the CBT studies. ISTDP has about 60 uh, studies on the effectiveness of the model, and we're finding significant effect sizes. It's effective with uh, personality disorders, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, and so on, and, uh, and also with psychosomatic disorders. In fact, with uh, short-term therapies, uh, uh, ISTDP is the only model in short-term therapy that's effective with somatic disorders. Um, so there's about 60 studies, and the effect sizes are very good. When we look at effect size, that's also important. Um, the placebo effect is about 0.25 of an effect size. Um, medication is about 0.3 of an effect size. So about 80% of the effectiveness of psychotropic medications is due to placebo effect. The average effect um, uh, for uh, cognitive therapy is about 0.5, so it's significantly above 0.25 and 0.35. Uh, the CB, uh, ISTDP studies we have, though, where we're seeing effect sizes ranging from 0.7 to 1.4. So we're seeing very large effect sizes. Now, those effect sizes in ISTDP, which are very large, are also probably due to the fact that we're working with sicker patients. Because in a sense, the worse off a patient is, the more he can Prove. So in that sense, it shows the difficulty of really uh, assessing, is ICB better than CBT? We can't. There's no head-to-head -head study. We can't make that claim. We don't make that claim. In fact, what's interesting, when you look at outcome research, the differences in outcome between models of therapy is actually not so great. What is huge is the differences between the worst and the best practitioners in any model. So what that's showing us is that, uh, is that what we really need to be paying attention to is how do we improve the education of psychotherapists so that we get a much greater um, quality within each model? Because what we can see is that the issue here is probably not so much the effectiveness of any model, but the effectiveness of our teaching given models, and that that may be actually a more serious issue in terms of outcome at this point. But again, we'll have to see what research tells us. But I do think it's important that when you look at the research, it's very important if you're very modest. There's some people try to make really grand claims, but the research doesn't support grand claims. It supports that, I, that therapy is very effective, but it doesn't, there's no model that's succeeding with 100% of patients. So no one's in a position to brag or claim theirs is the best.